Imagine a warning that sends shivers worldwide. It's happening in Israel. The world's on edge because of what's coming from this tiny country. The more terrifying thing is the prophecies getting fulfilled. So let's dive into this video today to uncover the spine-chilling prophecies in Israel that are shaking up the globe. After World War II, Jewish people were scattered far from their homes because of the war. They lost their connection to Israel, the place that was important to them. But something amazing happened. God kept his promise. On May 14, 1948, a leader named David Ben-Gurion, who was in charge of the Jewish agency, declared that Israel was officially established. This special moment was discussed in books like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah in the Old Testament. Those books predicted that Israel would be restored. In the book of Ezekiel, there is a strong prophecy in chapter 36, verse 24. It says, I will take you out of the nations, gather you from all countries, and bring you back into your land. This means God promised to bring the Jewish people back from all the places they were scattered and bring them back to their land. They would become His people again. Jeremiah in chapter 30 also talked about God comforting His people. God promised to bring them back from being captured and bring them back to the land that their ancestors were given. These prophecies focused on gathering the Jewish people who were sent away and bringing them back to the land that God promised to give them. What is Israel now? Today, when we look at Israel, we can see that the old predictions from a long time ago are happening. The land that was promised to the Jewish people is now their home. This shows us that when God promises something, it lasts very long. The Jewish people returning to their homeland makes these old predictions come true. But there's even more to the story. Nowadays, Israel has to deal with tough weather. It's hot and dry, and the land doesn't have much that grows naturally. But guess what? Something amazing is going on. The people of Israel are growing lots of crops from land that seemed like it couldn't grow anything. Even the trees in Israel produce way more than trees in other places like Russia. How do they do it? They believe in a promise from the Bible from a part called Zechariah chapter 8, verse 12. It says, The seed will grow well, the vine will yield its fruit, the ground will produce its crops, and the heavens will drop their dew. This means they trust that God will make their crops grow even in tough conditions. It might sound surprising, but we can see God's promises happening right before us. The fulfillment of these really old predictions is so cool to see. One of these predictions, said by a person named Zechariah, is related to what's happening politically in the Middle East right now. In Zechariah's prediction in chapter 12, something big is foretold. It says, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. Anyone who tries to move it will hurt themselves. These words from the really old prediction talk about Jerusalem being a strong force that stays put even when things are difficult. Prophecies unfolding in Israel. The connection between Jerusalem, Israel, and religious faith shows how important this special land is to people who believe in God. The old predictions seem to be coming true through the land in Israel becoming productive again and the expected rebuilding of the third temple. Some predictions about Jerusalem and Israel have already happened, while others are still being discussed. The first prediction is about the land changing from being unable to grow anything to becoming prosperous. In the Old Testament, a prediction in Zechariah chapter 8 verse 12 talks about Israel's success, saying, the seed will grow well, the vine will yield its fruit, and the ground will produce its crops. It's like magic. This prediction has happened. Israel used to have land that couldn't grow much because it was dry and there wasn't a lot of water. But now Israel is a leader in using fancy technology for farming. They have smart ways of watering the crops, like drip irrigation, which helps the crops grow a lot while using less water. Scientists have also figured out how to make crops that can survive when there's not much rain. They've worked on projects to make the soil better so that even places that couldn't grow things before can now grow crops. All of this progress in farming and making the land green again is like the old predictions coming true. 
Third Temple and its Importance The Third Temple in Jerusalem is a really important place for many people. It's considered even more special than the old temples that aren't there anymore. Even though it hasn't been built yet, many people are excited about it. For Orthodox Jews, it's not just a building, it's a super special symbol of holiness and a place to pray. Starting in 1987, a group called the Temple Movement has been getting ready to build the Third Temple. Even though many people in the world today don't pay much attention to religious things, Orthodox Jews are serious about this. They've brought back a religious committee called the Sanhedrin, which is responsible for ensuring everything is done right when they rebuild the temple. Their goal is to build it exactly how it's supposed to be according to religious rules. For Orthodox Jews, rebuilding the temple is important for making the world better. They believe that things can only get better once the temple is built again. And guess what? The return of Israel to the land that was promised to them and the building of the third temple match up with what was said in the Bible by prophets like Ezekiel and Isaiah. These prophets talked about God promising to bring back His people. There's a quote from Ezekiel in the Bible that says, Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. This means that when God's special place, the sanctuary, is with the Jewish people, everyone will know that Israel is special. God always planned to bring the Jewish people back to the land in a special way. And after many, many years of being spread out everywhere, they were finally back, just like the prophecy said. Another quote from Isaiah in the Bible says, I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. This means that God wanted his sons and daughters from all over the world to come back to the special land he promised them. It's like a big gathering from everywhere. But you might be wondering why they want to build the third temple when there's a belief that Yeshua serves in the true tabernacle in heaven. Well, it's not just a building, it's a home for God's special presence. A quote from the Bible says, Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. The prophet Ezekiel saw God's special presence leave the old temple, but he also saw that it would come back and stay in a new, forever home in Jerusalem. A smart Jewish philosopher from a long time ago named Rambam said the third temple isn't just a redo of history. It's a symbol that shows God is always with his people, forever. So building the third temple isn't just about the past. It's about showing that God is always present with his people. With this reconstruction, something mysterious was also found. A big deal that lots of people are talking about has to do with the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This place is special for Jewish and Muslim communities because it's been important for a long time. Recently, they found something interesting under the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount. This mosque is important to Muslims, and they believe it was built by a really important person named Abraham a long time ago. But guess what? Under the mosque, they found a special place where Jewish people used to do rituals to make themselves spiritually clean. This is a big deal because it shows that this place is important for different religions. A guy named Robert Hamilton, who studies old things in the ground, found this special thing after an earthquake messed up the mosque. He found a Jewish ritual bath called a mikvah under the mosque's floor. This mikvah was important for Jewish people a long time ago during a time called the Second Temple Period. It was a place for them to get spiritually clean before going up to the special area of the Temple Mount. What's interesting about this discovery is that it changes what people used to think. Some people believed there was never an ancient Jewish temple at this place, but thanks to this find, history is kind of changing. People who study old things look at old records and find proof that there was an ancient temple at the Temple Mount. It's not just about old stuff. It shows how important religion and culture are to this special place. It's like finding a missing puzzle piece that changes how we see this important site. It's like shining a new light on its history and religious meaning. And then there was the arrival of red heifers. Following this, something really interesting happened in Israel. Five special red heifers arrived from a ranch in Texas. A lot of people who believe in the prophecy of building the third temple in Jerusalem are excited about this. 
It's like a part of the prophecy coming true. These heifers are young, under a year old, and if they stay completely red without any problems, they can be used to make ashes. These ashes are super important in Jewish law to clean people who have been near a dead body, especially for the priests who will work in the future temple. These special heifers had to follow the rules of the Israeli Veterinary Authority. So they went to Haifa for a seven-day quarantine when they arrived. After that, they will go to two places in Israel, one open for the public to see. They'll be taken care of until they are three years old, and then they can be sacrificed, and their ashes can be made following Jewish law. A group called Bona Israel, made up of Jews and Christians, played a big part in bringing these heifers to Israel. Byron Stinson, a rancher from Texas and an advisor for the organization, raised these special cattle. When they arrived at Ben-Gurion Airport, there was a welcome ceremony attended by important people from the Temple Institute. These red heifers are super important in the Bible. The book of Numbers 19 talks about using their ashes to make the Israelites clean of impurity. These ashes were really important for special rituals in the temple. So seeing red heifers today is like a sign for many people that the third temple is going to be built, and it's connected to the return of Christ. According to tradition, Nine red heifers have been sacrificed since the time of Moses, but none since the second temple was destroyed. Rabbi Maimonides said that the Messiah himself would sacrifice the tenth red heifer. So when these five perfect red heifers from Texas arrived in Israel on September 15, 2022, a lot of people saw it as a prophecy coming true and a big step toward building a new temple. The rules for a red heifer are strict under the Mosaic law. It must be without defect or blemish and should never have worn a yoke. The process of sacrificing a red heifer involved special rituals, like using a female animal, sacrificing away from the entrance, and the specified color of the animal. All of these rules and rituals about the red heifer in the Bible are like a preview of the sacrifice of Christ. Jesus was like the red heifer, without blemish. Just like the red heifer was sacrificed outside the camp, Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem. And just as the red heifer's ashes made people clean from death's contamination, Jesus' sacrifice cleanses us from the punishment and corruption of sin and death. Further, there was the rediscovery of the ancient pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam was another discovery, a place 53 feet long, 18 feet wide, and 19 feet deep. Skilled hands crafted it using natural rocks. Sadly, it was destroyed when Babylon attacked Jerusalem and the Second Temple. But here's the good news. It got rebuilt during Nehemiah's time and became even bigger when Herod the Great was in charge. This pool was a special place where poor and sick people came for healing. It was super important during the Feast of Tabernacles, which celebrates the time when the Israelites got free from Egypt. The Festival of Booths, or Sukkot, is a big deal in Judaism. It remembers the time when they got free from Egypt and survived in the desert. People build temporary sukkahs, like their ancestors' shelters in the wilderness. Sukkot is a way of saying thanks to God and asking for rain. It's a celebration happening in Jewish communities all around the world. During Sukkot, a priest used to get water from the pool of Siloam in a golden pitcher, singing psalms and being happy. Then he poured the water on the altar's west side, showing something special from Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3 says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So pouring the water during Sukkot was like saying they were joyful and drawing water from the wells of salvation. It's like a happy ceremony during the Festival of Booths, and the Pool of Siloam plays a big part in it. Even though the original pool was destroyed, it was rebuilt, and people continued to celebrate and find joy in their traditions. After the rebuilding of a Pool of Siloam, a water libation ceremony took place. On October 12th, many people came together for a special ceremony called the Water Libation. It's kind of like what they used to do in the Old Temple a long time ago. The ceremony was led by special priests, Kohanim, who wear special clothes, and Levites, who play musical instruments. They started in the old city of Jerusalem at Shahar Hashpot, 
and went to Shiloh, also known as Siloam Springs, following the same paths as they did in the time of the old temple. During the parade at each stop, people chanted, danced, and played silver trumpets. Important rabbis supervised the event, and the group had a golden jug filled with water from the Shylock pool. They returned to the mountain summit, where they set up a model altar and tools, just like in the old temple. The altar was decorated with big, leafy branches, continuing the ancient temple tradition. The ceremony ended with the priestly blessing and the hakel ceremony, which only happens once every seven years. Even though the Torah doesn't mention the water ceremony, people see it as part of what Moses taught orally. It's like a happy holiday. This ceremony used to go on in the old temple for 15 hours, and the celebrations would continue all night until the next morning when the temple service started again. People from all over the world came to take part in the Sukkot celebrations, making it a day of worship for everyone. In the last six days of Sukkot, they did a water ceremony and poured wine during the morning service. The priests filled a flask with spring water and went from the temple to the Shylock Spring at the base of Mount Moriah. Two priests climbed the stone altar in the temple's courtyard and poured wine and water into special holes made for this ceremony. The Shiloh Pool, also known as Shalom in English and Silwan in Arabic, is important in the Bible. They believe it will come back to life after they finish building the third temple. Pilgrims used to start their journey to Jerusalem at this pool for the biblical feasts. After cleaning themselves in the pool, they would go to the inner court of the Temple Mount to give their sacrifices. They found the pool in 2004 and are still digging and exploring it. According to the Babylonian Talmud, the year after the Shemitah, a special year, is thought to be lucky for the Messiah to come. A prophecy in the book of Amos says the tribe of Israel will be brought back from other nations. The Talmud also talks about the hard times that will happen before the Messiah comes. It's not clear if the Jews will build another real temple before Christ comes again because a spiritual temple is already being built. The most important thing is to be part of God's spiritual temple by living a life devoted to God and being ready for whatever challenges might come in the end times. After the ceremony recently, a marriage also took place in Temple Mount. In Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 11, there's a prophecy that talks about a happy time with the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, showing the joy connected to the arrival of a future Messiah and the third temple. This prophecy has started a trend in Israel, where Jewish people visit the revered Temple Mount, thinking of it as a sign of the Messiah's coming. A couple from Rehovot and Tel Mond, Eitan Krantman and Coral Daisy Dean, recently got engaged on the Temple Mount, and this practice is becoming popular among Jewish couples. They combine the two parts of a traditional Jewish marriage, Kiddushin, betrothal, and Nisuin, wedding ceremony, under the chuppah. This emphasizes the belief in humanity's creation in God's image and the formation of an everlasting union. This special moment on the Temple Mount connects to a verse from Jeremiah that is often recited at weddings, predicting a time of joy and thanksgiving in the land. The Temple Mount even has historical gates for bridegrooms and mourners, known as the Gate of Mercy. As more Jewish couples choose the Temple Mount for their engagements, they see it as the fulfillment of ancient prophecies, like Zechariah chapter 8 verses 20 and 22, which talks about people from different cities coming to Jerusalem to pray to the Lord. These events are seen as awe-inspiring and in line with biblical prophecies. So, what do you think of these warnings from Israel? Comment below and subscribe for more.